Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, let me first say how happy I am to be back in Israel and secondly to say how happy I am to be at the Technicum. This is not simply personal but also the fact that the Technicum is a member of the International Association of Universities and therefore I have the opportunity and responsibility of giving you an institutional greeting as well as a personal one. The second thing I want to say is that, um, how can I put it, after the very hard-hitting speech of uh, Mr. Harari, I have to confess that, um, as you can see, I'm not only a historian, but I'm also one of that particularly awful type of historians that has a beard and has not shaved for 25 years. So it's a certain irony that I shall speak, be speaking to you this, after, this morning on the question of Occam's razor. <laughs> when we look around Europe's higher education landscape over the past 10 years, one thing has, cannot fail to strike many of us, and that is the brand and arrival of a whole host of new labels to describe that thing that once was called the university. There are entrepreneurial universities, service universities, responsive universities, and at the less creditable level, European universities, humanitarian universities, and a final monument to Monsieur de la Paris, learning universities. There are other descriptors which are much more useful and of course are regularly used in our vocabulary open universities, distance teaching universities, and virtual universities. Now, this suggests from the plethora of descriptive names that, in fact, the boundaries of institutional form seem, at least linguistically, to be fraying somewhat at the edge. And the question we have to pose ourselves, therefore, is whether these are real subtypes, a new, or whether they are, in fact, new species. In short, when we view the higher, the higher edu land, the edu education landscape in Europe, we're faced with the question of whether the postmodern version of the once singular university is not in blatant contradiction with a very old principle that was stated by the medieval schoolman, William of Ockham, which in Latin was entia non sunt multiplicanda sine necessitate. In a modern, a modern language, it would be you shouldn't multiply your categories without good reason. Now, univer that the universities differentiate themselves, of course, is not, not new. It is part of the usual bound, um, of the usual, usual drive of scholarship and excellence to state itself in ways that it understands and recognizes what it is doing. But I suggest to you that this rise of new, a new, a new, a new uh, series of descriptors, this new nomenclature, is in fact not wholly in that tradition. It has another driving force behind it. And we have talked about it in various forms, more particularly George uh, Libon mentioned it en passant, the rise of what some of us in Western Europe have identified with what we call the evaluative state. That is, that those agencies that are in charge of, if you want in concrete terms, in the shape of performance ratings, league tables, ratings, rankings, plethora of agencies in, dis, uh, in charge of if you watch, what you might call judgmental activities. The evaluative state, in fact, has done a number of important things, and I would summarize them under four heads. First, what it has done is by pl it has placed academic competition and self-knowledge into the public arena, and this is extremely important. First, it placed the competitive principle in the heart of the new relationship between government and higher education. Second, it did away with the long-preserved legal fiction often held in continental Europe and which much reference has been made over the past day or so that universities were all on a formal footing of equality in condition and status. Third, it erected universities' private knowledge about themselves. We've always known where the good universities are and where are the, the less good universities, although it is never often shared. It allowed the private knowledge of the universities about themselves to form 
a major instrument, a major part and a dimension in the domain of public policy. And finally, and perhaps most of important in all, it introduced what you might call a major challenge to the perennity of institutional standing by making institutional evaluation and assess assessment regularly to be repeated. In other words, reputations once built up were not always guaranteed to stay at that, that way ad, vina, uh, ad vitam eternitatem for all time. And what I want to try and do this morning is to make a parallel drive in the time that re remains to me to one which Torsten Niebohm has done, but using different, a roughly similar uh, classification uh, uh, chronology, but a different angle. And I, what I want to do is to examine the drive towards mass higher education in Western Europe, no other, because I'm, my education is very specialized and I can't possibly go outside that rather limited boundary, in the process of differentiation as policy. And I want to suggest to you that there are three stages in the process of, de uh, of differentiation. And this paper that I have here, I want to try and track them through. But I want to track them through not with regard to the undergraduate university. That's what most of us in higher education do in Western Europe. But we forget, and this is why this meeting for me is extremely precious. I very rarely get the privilege of talking to people whose being and work and achievement is in the area of the hard, natural, mathematical, exact sciences. Most of us in Western Europe who call ourselves policy people tend to talk to those in the social sciences, either to economists, public administration people, or political scientists. And so this, for me, is a very rare and precious occasion for the advantage of being able to dialogue with people uh, beyond my ken. If we look at the stage of first stage of massification, it has to do with, in fact, the 60s and 70s. And it has to do with the principle of, of differentiation by segmentation, by sexual segmentation by the creation of a new vehicle to bear forward mass higher education, which had very little, if anything, to do with the research training system. The university, basically, in the first stage of this particular period, which I would identify as running from 19, about 1961 to around 1978, effectively created a non-university sector, the purpose of which was to absorb the bulk of demand coming from society. And if you want to, in, in another way, to deflect much of that demand from that most delicate of all areas in the higher education system, namely the research training system. We've mentioned this and uh, yesterday with considerable eloquence, Grant, Grant Harmon gave us examples of the rise of this parallel deflective system of short course, short cycle higher education. I could add simply by saying that the examples which he quoted for Australia for the 60s and 70s were paralleled a little bit earlier in Europe, in France in the forms of the University's Institutes of Technology, in Britain at the same time with the polytechnics which we've mentioned, because that's our crossing point, and other establishments such as those who are Dutch, have a reference of, in the, in, to the Netherlands, the higher vocational education, the Berups on the base, which um, followed a similar track. The first stage, which in, I argued affected in no way at all the research training system, did nevertheless pose a number of very important questions. In what type of establishment, for example, should research training be located? In the, hum, in the Humboldtian construct of research, of te the link between teaching and research, is this to be preserved? Can it be, reserved, be, be preserved? If it can be preserved, can it be preserved in establishments which are open to the usual run-of-the-mill student coming forward into higher education and under what conditions? Supposing they are to preserve, be preserved, is it only to be preserved in elite establishments? And finally, a question was later to be opened by the United Kingdom. Is there an intermediary construct between the link between research and training a kind of Humboldtian ersatz linked around the notion of scholarship. These questions, of course, are evergreen, and I want to suggest to you that some of the answers 
began to emerge in the second phase of the policy as differentiation in Western Europe beginning in the early part of the 80s. And during this phase, which I suggest to you lasted roughly the, the, up to the about 18, um, 19, 1992, 1994, which fo this particular phase no longer fo focused on sexual dif uh, differentiation, but rather on differentiation within sectors. It had to do with institutional differ differentiation, and in fact, MESH very completely uh, began to bear down on the research training system and the way it should be reformed. It is, I think, an interesting straw in the wind that if you look at the way in which the discourse of higher education was conducted in Western Europe, we tended only, I would say, up to the middle to late 1980s to believe, as you have all discussed here, because it is naturally part of your universe in Israel, that the, that the university was the research university. It was taken for granted that universities did research just as they did teaching. And the introduction in the late 80s of the term research university, as you have, many of you have observed, was a, not only a straw in the wind, but the, the introduction of the notion that there were to be entities some were called universities which did not do research. This, in fact, this uh, um, break in, if you want, the traditional model of European universities was not only a straw in the wind, and also the notion of research universities growing much more current. It was, in fact, a, an identifying feature which characterized what I said, uh, presented to you as the second stage in, the po in policy as differentiation. The first system to begin deliberately to unpack the, what you might call the Humboldtian Concord that had developed in Western Europe from Germany into Sweden and into the Netherlands. From my point of view was the Dutch in 1981 when they proposed moving and did in fact move the research training element, the introduction and initiation into research from the, under, from the first Dutch degree, the Dr. Anders, which was a five-year degree, and shifted it over to the research system itself, thereby hoping to make the throughput in the first degree more efficient by moving that to the next stage and foreshortening it. Efficiency wasn't the only reason for this particular development. And it had to do, and another development was also the uncoupling of the PhD from its prime historic purpose namely the training and perpetuation and renewal of the academic estate. Other tasks were coming up and demanding attention. What those tasks which have brought about a, diver a, a greater diversity in the occupational outlets to which the traditional PhD ought to be coupled, a feature which began to assume more weight towards the end of the 90s, which we have we now couple in with the notion of the knowledge society. There are a number of responses to this, and if you look at the different countries with which I'm concerned, primarily the Netherlands for obvious reasons, also France because I live there, and the United Kingdom because I suppose I'm a professional exile from it, there are uh, three particular interesting ways in which this process of differentiation took place. In France, it began in the reform of 1987, which brought together four doctorates of varying length from the short cycle doctorate of lasting about three years to the magnificent doctorat d'état. And those of you who remember, are familiar with that will know that for historians, the doctor, to get the doctorat d'état could lasted anything up to 15, could last anything up to 15 years. Brought together in one particular form and interestingly represented at that time as the Anglo-Saxon doctorate, basically formulated around the American PhD. The United Kingdom itself was engaged in an unprecedented and comprehensive exercise, but it was not to do with the reform of the, the, the nomenclature of the PhD because that had existed in the United Kingdom since about 1920. It was rather to do with a much more strategic development, which was both an unprecedented and comprehensive exercise of norm setting and standardization, laying out what could be seen as a national framework 
for regulating the research trading system, and in which a greater control what began to be exercised on not only simply through via funding, but also by norms themselves developed by the various research councils. Not only were there times on task of what the Ger Germans called the Regelstudienzeit, the uh, regulatory length by which PhDs should be finished were introduced, but there was also an interesting decision made, which is to see the master's degree as a species of screening device a preliminary for embarking on the doctoral program. The other aspect which I wish to briefly bring towards your, uh, to your attention has to do with a major change in the creation of a new organizational unit in the research training system in, uh, the, in both the Netherlands, France and Germany. This has to do with the development of what you might see as a European equivalent of the graduate school. Like, like many things that you take over from somebody else, you translate it to your own circumstances and your own benefit. And in the development of the graduate schools, which go under the particular different names in the Netherlands, they are the research schools, in Germany the graduate and college, and the French the école doctorale. These bodies were much more elite, much more focused than the American graduate school. They focused uniquely on the doctoral level training and they were also designed as a way of creating links with other occupations which hitherto had been, if you want, outside the purlieu of doctoral training. You can see in that case a species of relative diversity in the objectives to which that particular degree now led. Now, there are, I don't, without going into the details for which I wish to spare your stomach, uh, because uh, uh, um, it is quite late, let me say that the, uh, if you look across these three particular institutions, it is, a number of things are very clear. And the first is the greater part of, uh, 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 played in their operation uh, by research councils or national academies. For instance, in the ne Netherlands, the Onderzoek School and the research schools there are accredited by the Royal Dutch, Acad uh, uh, the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences. They change in their emphasis too. Um, the French put a particular weight on cross-sectoral uh, linkages either into the region and also between the, a particular graduate school in one university linking across to another. And here I would suggest to you that the notion of interconnectedness of, the, of a particular graduate, uh, uh, graduate school, which is a disciplinary-based thing, in, based in one, one university with other uh, universities, is a major, inside the nation, nation, is a major feature which I think you might possibly um, have a little interest in. It's not just that no other links limited to the system in which it's located. If I take, for example, the graduate and college in, in Germany, there are at least of the approximately 280 which are currently existed, there are 30 which are specialized precisely in uh, joint system doctoral degrees with their neighbors in France and in the Netherlands. The doctoral school is not, therefore, simply a more focused European variety and variation on the American version. They also represent another aspect which is important. They represent Europe's response, or at least that's the way Europe is conceived, and given Torsten's comments on it, maybe they conceive it wrongly, to the worldwide competition for talent that stands at the heart of the knowledge economy. That said, you will ask me, these are relatively new developments. What effect do they have on the new universities in which they are located. The doctoral schools, certainly there's evidence of considerable tension between the doctoral schools and their, those university systems that retain the faculty as an organizational unit. Why? Because they are funded largely in a separate money stream from the university. And there's also the question that they concentrate together most of the research students in that particular discipline. So the question arises, who is to wag the academic dog? Is it to be the research tail or is it to be the faculty head? 
and that kind of, these kind of tensions have certainly have been noted by studies that have been done by my establishment on their counterparts in the Netherlands. But beneath this, there's another problem, and that problem is how to define the outer boundaries of the research training system. In the Netherlands, this is, posed, uh, is a particular issue because we cannot charge full costs for, fee, for fees at undergraduate level. And therefore, for many, of the, many universities, the masters is a taught masters is a way by which they can generate revenue. If you put the, uh, for example, you see the masters as an extension of the undergraduate experience, then clearly you are, in fact, not only dividing the old, old, again, the division between uh, uh, teaching and learning, making that even greater, but you are um, moving um, resources from faculties um, that otherwise might need them. I just let me skip this thing and become onto, the, onto my conclusions. Much of the conclusions I said presume a certain continuity in the sectors that constitute our higher education systems in the Netherlands, France, and Germany. But there is evidence, however, of new forms of cross-institutional organization emerging. There are new combinations of establishments joining their strengths together, sometimes on a regional basis. An example of this is the French Technopole. Uh, there are, there's one around Bordeaux, there's another in Lyon, where establishments, whether they're engineering establishments, whether they are university or whether they are a, a university institute of technology, join together to form a kind of um, competitive cluster to attract not only foreign students but be able to have a presence and to attract students who are becoming more and more mobile, as you realize, in Europe. In my own country, well, the country where I have at least one foot in the grave, in Twente, which is a, uh, an engineering university, there we have a new policy which is coming to shape in the form of institutional clustering slightly different from the French. To give you an example, the University of Twente is joining up with the technological universities of Delft and Eindhoven to create, at least on a European scale, if not a worldwide, wide center of excellence in the area of engineering. Now, the graduate school, as I tried to describe it briefly and perhaps obscurely, corresponds to this notion that the, you do not rely it simply on the uh, one university that the student attends to call on skills elsewhere. The principle of linking in uh, and drawing the skills that you lack in the university, you lack to provide a stimulating curriculum at the, at, the, at the graduate teaching level, allows you to draw on not only on students, but also on other members uh, of staff elsewhere. It is, in fact, an interesting example of the physical boundaries of institutional uh, precision uh, beginning to break down. Let me conclude there in respect for your patience, your indulgence, and last of all, of your stomachs. What is very clear in Western Europe over the past decade and a half is that the legal fiction of a world once Humboldtian is under very heavy revision. The instruments of review, which earlier we alluded to under the notion of the value to state, or rather en passant, the procedures that surround them have most certainly become powerful forces in standardization. They are becoming extremely prominent in determining the fate, repute, and standing of individual universities and establishments within the diversity of mass higher education. This, dear colleagues, is a situation in which our medieval schoolman, William of Ockham, would have agreed with fully. For in essence, what matters is not how universities describe themselves, but how they perform, or to, perform, or to return to the wisdom of, our medieval, of medieval William himself, as many as you can, but as few as you may. Thank you. <laughs>